Well, everyone, this episode of the podcast is brought to you by I Love Growing Marijuana. Now, I know you know about all the seeds that they have. And right now, they even have a special on White Widow Feminized, buy 10, get 10 free. But that's not what I want to talk about today. Did you also know the different ways that you can pay for those seeds? You can pay for them with cash. That's right. If you send them an envelope of cash, they will send you seeds. You can also do a bank transfer, use a credit card. You can even use Bitcoin to buy those seeds. So if you've got any of that new fancy money, you can use that too. So click on the link in the show notes to get over to I Love Growing Marijuana. Now, after you get those seeds, you're going to have to think about a plant DNA sex testing kit, like the one that Delta Leaf Labs has. Now, they make it really easy to take a sample from your plant, and you send that sample into the lab, and a couple of days after they get it, you're going to know whether that plant that you've got is a male or a female plant. You're going to know whether you want to spend your time and money on that plant because of what Delta Leaf Lab tells you. So go over to DeltaLeafLabs.com, order your testing kits, and at checkout, use promo code IMGS10 to get 10% off of that order. All right, now let's start this show. Brothers and sisters, this is the In My Grow Show, the podcast dedicated to taking the mystery out of cannabis. I am your host, Alex, and I want to thank you, <clears throat> excuse me, and I want to thank you all for joining me today. I hope everyone's doing great. I'm doing wonderful. It's a beautiful day outside. The sun is shining. It is a little windy, but that's all right. I can handle that. I don't mind the wind too much. I don't suffer from allergies the way my wife and my daughter do, so that's a good thing. All right, so this past week, I cracked a few seeds. And there were just three or four seeds that I'd found in a jar that I had on a shelf. I don't know what they were. I didn't mark the jar. I'm sure they were pretty good because I must have put them on the shelf and saved them for a reason. And to crack those seeds, I used the cup of water and wet paper towel in a Ziploc bag technique. So what I did is I'll soak the seeds in in water for two days. By then, you know, it has a little, just a little telltale sign of a taproot coming out. I'll take those seeds and put them in a wet paper towel and then slide that paper towel into a Ziploc bag and make sure that the bag has a little pocket of air. It's almost like a little pillow. And after about two days, a nice long tap root's gonna come out of those and they'll be ready to just uh, delicately, very carefully put them into some soil. I don't wanna manhandle that root and that little seedling too much because they are delicate roots. So I did that, got them into some soil. I put up some pictures about it on Instagram and uh, my buddy Derek Gilman suggested hanging or suspending the Ziploc to get straight tap roots. Gravity will draw the roots downward, that's what he said, which makes sense because usually when I sprout seeds that way, the tap roots come out really uh, twisted and it makes it a little hard to get them into the soil without kind of, you know, breaking them or messing them up. So I did that for one day and it does seem like the roots were a little straighter, but it's hard to really tell if that was from hanging the bag or that's just the way they grew next time i'm gonna try that for both days and see how that goes and i will let you know somebody somebody on instagram also suggested to soak the seeds in a one-to-one ratio of water to hydrogen peroxide but that'll help the tap roots you know develop nice and strong so i'm gonna try that next time as well and that'll probably be in a f- couple of weeks probably like two or three weeks i'm gonna i plan on cracking more seeds and i'll let you know how that goes also with the hydrogen peroxide soak Now, next week, everybody, if you didn't know, it is 420 next weekend. Yay, it lands on a Saturday. Now, I want you all to celebrate as much as you need to. Get as high as a fucking kite. Get lit as a Christmas tree. Do it safely. Okay, please. Because the man is out there looking for you, all intoxicated, driving slow, being overly cautious. They know how to find you in your car, man. Doing 15 miles an hour on the freeway. Come on. All right. Now, a couple of local reminders for that day. There will be a special screening at the Alcazar Theater in Carpinteria, California, of Reefer Madness. It says here, Saturday, April 20th, from 7 to 8.30 p.m., join Copson for a look at the classic 1936 propaganda film Reefer Madness. This event will include remarks by a local film specialist and Q&A with the audience. Tickets are $15 and available at thealcazar.org. For questions, email info at copsun.com. That is K-O-P-S-U-N. Please remember, there will be no cannabis products for sale at this event. 
Carpinteria is a smoke-free city and the Alcazar Theater strongly enforces this ordinance. So you cannot get high in the theater. You must show up already high for this event. Okay? Please, take your edibles 15, 20 minutes before and you'll be good. Or, you know, smoke in your car. No, I'm kidding. Don't smoke in your car. The cops might catch you. Just show up high beforehand. All right. Also coming up, the quarterly cannabis workshop and networking event. That is April 18th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Impact Hub. That is 1117 State Street, Santa Barbara. Tickets are $15 in advance, $20 at the door. If you don't have your tickets, you should get them real soon because these events do sell out typically. It is uh, limited seating. I love going to these events. I've, I've been to quite a few of them. There is a link in the show notes if you need to buy tickets. Let's see, this time we will be hearing from Rodney Medina, who is a media specialist. Also speaking will be Chelsea Satula from Sespe Creek Collective, Colin Dvorak from San Marcos Consulting, and Jay Higgins from H&H &H Environmental. So like I said, get your tickets if you don't have them already. And now I'd like to move on to the strain of the week. And today I'm going to give it up to the Dutch Treat. That's right, yes, it's actually called the Dutch Treat. I like this flower. It was a nice smoke. It had this really nice fruity sweet mix taste to it, like pine trees and mangoes. It wasn't too much of a heavy hitter, so it was great for daytime use and getting stuff done. But at the same time, it was also very relaxing. So if you see it out there, the Dutch Treat is the one you want. Now I want to talk about something that I've been hearing about lately, and that is microdosing THC. So I decided to macrodose myself and think about how I feel about microdosing THC. Which basically means I decided to roll a joint and smoke it all by myself and think about what this means. So I'm going to play devil's advocate for a bit. So part of me thinks that this whole term microdosing THC is just a way of you wanting to be high at work. How high can you be at work without anybody noticing that you're high? That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. I get it. As long as you don't have a job where you put people's lives in danger, do your job high. If you can do it and succeed and, uh, fuck, even dazzle people sometimes, do it high. Go for it. I do it sometimes when I can. Shit, I'm doing it right now. And the other part of me says, all right, well, look, I get it. Okay. You want to take as little THC as you can to get the benefits, you know, to feel relaxed and not, you know, and a little euphoric. Which is fine if that's what you need to get you through your day. I get it. You know, but you don't want to take so much to where you're really intoxicated, really paranoid, and really anxious. Sounds good. I understand. I mean, it's like trying to find your dosage for any kind of medication. It's how I see it when I think about it that way, you know. So, why does microdosing THC bug me so much? Um, you know, I'm not really sure why. I don't think I ever figured that out. I think I need to macrodose myself some more and figure that out. It might have a little bit to do with the fact that I've been hearing the, the word, the term microdose being used so much, but associated with, you know, psilocybin and psychedelics, LSD being used therapeutically. You know, it just seems like the cannabis industry is trying to grab onto the latest buzz phrase to get people's attention. I don't know why that bugs me so much. I get it. It's marketing. Okay. Like I said, I'm going to macrodose myself some more and uh, figure it out. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is that... I subscribe to a magazine called the Marijuana Business Magazine, and the latest issue is titled The Salary Survey. Cannabis industry workers can earn more than their mainstream counterparts. And it's a pretty interesting read, man, because they, they have this little chart that breaks down how much people in the cannabis industry make as opposed to people in other industries that have kind of a similar job. All right, let's talk about a few of them. All right, a cannabis industry security worker, on average... And this information comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, payscale.com, salary.com, and ZipRecruiter. All right, and the security worker in cannabis will make about $34,000, which is $7,000 higher than casino security, $390 higher than protective services workers. I don't know what that means. Is that like the Secret Service? Anyways. And $3,000 more than mainstream security guards. Hmm. Uh, let's see, let's see. Cannabis-infused edibles producer 
will make about $46,000. That is $16,000 higher than a cooking machine operator. What is that? Is that someone who makes like frozen meals? I don't know. It says here $18,000 higher than a baker. $17,000 more than general food processor. I don't even know what that is. But they make $3,000 less than chefs and head cooks. So if you know how to bake, you should go make edibles, apparently. All right, now bud tenders. They on average make $32,000, which it says here is $10,000 more than a cashier, $3,000 higher than a pharmacist's aide. Wow, you probably didn't even have to go to school to be a bud tender. And $5,000 more than a bartender. Ooh. All right, bud trimmers. They'll make on average 29000 and that's 5000 higher than agricultural product grades and sorters. And that's also $4,000 higher than farm workers, laborers in the crop, nursery, and greenhouse sectors. Yeah, that issue is a pretty interesting read. And after I read that, it kind of made sense also why, from what I've been hearing, the wine industry, well, one of the reasons why the wine industry doesn't like cannabis is, is because the cannabis industry makes it harder for them to find cheaper labor, I guess. I don't want to say cheap labor, but cheaper labor. So if you have any of these particular skills, you should go work in the cannabis industry. All right, next, let's go on to the report from the Cannabis Frontline. First article is entitled, States Enact Legislation Facilitating Expungement for Low-Level Crimes. In Utah, Republican Governor Gary Herbert has signed House Bill 431, the Clean Slate Act, into law. The measure creates a process for the automatic expungement and deletion of certain criminal convictions, including misdemeanor convictions for the possession of a controlled substance. It says to be eligible for automatic expungement, one must have completed their sentence and possess no subsequent convictions for a period of five years. The new law takes effect in May 2020. Well, I wish that law took effect a little earlier than a year from now. But good for Utah for having some forward thinking and expungement, man. I love hearing that about people getting nonviolent cannabis convictions just taken off of their record, man, so they can move on with their life and get into something different or maybe even get into cannabis. You know, because a lot of the knowledge that the legal industry is built on was developed and discovered by people who were in this industry when it was still highly illegal. So, you know, I'm a big fan of expungement. All right. Also, in New Mexico, Democratic Governor Grisham signed into law House Bill 370, the Criminal Record Expungement Act. The act permits those convicted of certain violations, misdemeanors, or felonies following the completion of their sentence and payment of applicable fees to petition the court for an order to expunge arrest records and public records related to that conviction. Those seeking to vacate misdemeanor convictions must wait two years following the completion of their sentence and have no subsequent convictions prior to seeking expungement. Those with felony convictions must wait six years prior to petitioning the court. And that new law takes effect January 1, 2020. Next is a report, and the title is THC Limits Not Correlated to Driving Impairment. And it says a report issued by the Michigan Impaired Driving Safety Commission finds that peak THC blood levels are not associated with maximal behavior impairment and further finds that the compound's influence upon driver's performance varies significantly among individual consumers. Now, this isn't anything new, really. They're just talking about THC levels in the blood because THC does stick around in the blood for a while, like 22 days or something like that. But just because you have high levels of THC in your blood doesn't mean that you are impaired enough that you cannot drive. Those two things they have found do not go hand in hand. The question should be about impairment. You know, are you too high to drive at that moment? If you are too high to drive, don't get behind the wheel. Call an Uber. Call a friend. Hang out for a couple hours. Listen to a couple of records. But don't drive really, really fucking high, please. Or high at all. And the reason these reports are important is because some states actually measure intoxication by the amount or the nanograms of THC in your blood. I think the threshold in some states is like 5 nanograms per milliliter. So this report to me isn't anything new, but it helps reinforce you know, our argument that it's not the amount of THC in your blood that makes you too intoxicated to drive. And I got both of those stories off of the normal website. That is normal.org. Go over there, get informed, become a member. Next, I'm going to talk about the predator of the week, which is going to be the Nocilius cucumeris. 
I don't think I got that first part right, but I never do. I just call them the Cucamaris. And if you want to go over to inmygrow.com and look up in the search tab Cucamaris, that is C-U-C-U-M-E-R-I-S. If you type that into the search, article will come up about Cucamaris that I'm going to read from. If you want to do like a read-along, you know, remember how we used to have those books and records? Isn't it a trip how records are making their way back? Record players are everywhere now. But that has nothing to do with the Cucamaris. Let's get back to the Cucamaris. Now, it is a predatory mite, and it was first discovered around 1939. But they didn't really pay too much attention to it back then as far as it actually being used in farming for pest control. So they kind of just forgot about it for a little bit. It wasn't until around the 1980s when we started to worry about pests becoming resistant to chemicals that we started looking at uh, biological predators. You know, Because we were also figuring out that those chemicals that we were using for pesticides and insecticides were getting to the groundwater. They were messing up the environment. They were messing us up at the same time, you know, because we live in the environment. So that's when this whole big movement towards biological predators and using them in farming in a bigger way really started to come into effect. Now, this little tiny cucumeris will aggressively prey on immature pests. It really likes the thrips, the western flower thrip, the onion thrip, the melon thrip. What else you got? The common blossom thrip. They've even got chili thrips. <laughs> but they love all thrips. They also like to eat the spider mites, the two-spotted kind, along with other mites. Now, the cucumeris is a soft-bodied little, little bug. It's a little bit translucent, a little bit, you know, you can kind of see through them. They're usually like a tan kind of brown color, depending on what they're eating. And that's Dante saying hello. But anyways, where was I? Oh, yeah. Uh, the cucumeris are, you know, sometimes a little brown, a little tannish in color. And like I said, they're super, super small. So I suggest getting a jeweler's loop or some kind of magnification. 10 to 15% magnification should be enough for you to get a good look at them. Uh, the adults will live about 25 to 35 days on average. And they'll eat about uh, one thrip a day. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but that's also why we release a lot of them. Is because, you know, the adults are only going to eat one. And the adult female will lay about one to three eggs a day. So about 35 eggs she's going to lay throughout her whole life. And the cucumeris is going to move through a one larva stage and two nymphal stages before it becomes an adult. And that whole timeline from egg to adult is about 10 to 12 days. Then after those 10 to 12 days, obviously it's another about 25, 35 days of, of adulthood that they have. And they do love the warm weather. About 72 to 80 degrees is what they like. Relative humidity around 60%. When the temperatures get cooler, it's obviously going to slow down their activity. So the cooler the temps, the slower they're going to move and also grow and mature. The warmer they get, the more active they're going to get also. Now after the larvae hatch, they will not eat until they molt into that first nymph stage, which is about two days after they hatch. And once they start that nymph stage, they'll also start to eat any kind of insect pest that may be on your plant. A couple of things I have discovered about the cucumeris is that while they really do love to eat live prey. You know, they can survive on pollen, but they really do thrive when they have live prey thrown into their diet. And while they're really great at eating those live prey, they're kind of lazy predators. They, they don't wander too far to look for food. So I'll usually put some of them up in the canopy, and I'll also put some of them down below at the base or at the stem of the, of the plant. Because like I said, they're not going to travel very far. They're, I don't know, if this doesn't fall in front of them, they don't care. Who knows what that's about. But in order to get the best coverage, I'll just split them up. And when I get cucumerises, I usually get the slow release bag. There's these little bags that have about an, you know, an eighth of a cup of, of bran material in it with the predators, with the cucumeris. And they're these little bags that I can just hang on different spots of the garden. Um, I also know that, you know that you can buy it in bulk, just like loose material bran that you can spread around at the base of your plants which works great in greenhouses, but not so much outdoors just because of the wind. It'll blow it around. Now, I have heard from people who grow hydroponically, like in a reservoir, like a deep water culture, that hanging those little slow-release bags can kind of be a pain in the ass because some of that material that's inside of it can fall into the reservoir and kind of clog up some of the pumps and some, and some of the sprayers. So they don't really use those too much. I don't know what to tell you about that. I like using cucumeris. They're one of my top five predators to use. Now, I also understand because there are, they are lazy predators that they're not the only biological predator that I'm using in my garden. 
And I got some of that information from the Rincon Vitova website. That is rinconvitova.com. They're an insectary here in California. You should go over there, check it out. Well, mis amigos, my friends, that's all I've got for you today. Don't forget, next week is 420. Celebrate responsibly. I don't know what I'm doing yet, absolutely. I'm pretty sure I'm going to that Reefer Madness showing, but it's not absolute. Things are very fluid around here, man. Now remember, if this show has entertained you, educated you, or even given you a little escape from your day, go over to patreon.com slash show and donate a couple of bucks. Now those donations just help me run the show. They help me pay for certain hosting fees and equipment. So if you can, leave a donation. Now if you'd rather buy a t-shirt, you can go over to inmygrow.com, click on the tab that says support the show, and you can order a t-shirt from there. Another easy way you can help the show financially is to click on the Amazon link in the show notes before you go shopping to Amazon because that just lets them know that we sent you and we get a commission. Real easy. Now, if you can't support the show financially, don't worry about it. I get it. But here's how you can help. Subscribe to the website. Subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to it. And then tell three other people about the show. Really simple. Really easy. And if you are a cannabis company that wants to advertise to our worldwide audience, you can send an email to inmygrow at gmail.com. All right, everyone, I'm going to go ahead and get on out of here. Remember that I love you all very much. And to always grow, learn, and teach 